Hello everybody, today I want to talk about a kind of subcategory of cars that I think is genuinely underappreciated but is also one of my absolute favourites, the Runout Special. As humans, I think it's only natural that we are generally attracted to the new and to the shiny. For that reason, once something is four or five years old, no matter how good it is, we kind of tend to forget about it. And manufacturers are very aware of this. It's for that reason you get the facelift, or in BMW parlance, the life cycle impulse. They, in particular, are very guilty of uh, giving people something, taking it away, and then giving it back again, as they did with LED taillights on the 3 Series over a period of about 15 years and they do this because it works however when a model is due to be replaced entirely after six seven or eight years on sale sometimes you need to get a little bit more drastic for a few manufacturers this might mean introducing some new mechanical changes throwing a limited slip differential at it or perhaps a new tune but for other manufacturers sometimes the way they like to spice things up a bit is with a good old-fashioned limited edition and today i'm going to be shining a light on what i think is one of the best of them all this is the 2000 Range Rover Holland & Holland. If you are a subscriber to the channel, you may have already seen my review of a P38 generation Range Rover. That is this shape of car, which was in production from 1994 until 2001, making it officially the shortest lived Range Rover generation to date, with the exception of the new one that's only just gone on sale. And as the mechanical element of this car is essentially the same as that, I won't be discussing it in all that much detail today. So if you want to know more about my opinion of the model and the way that it drives, please check out the link to that video here or in the description down below. If you have not subscribed to the channel, I do recommend you check that video out, and I would also be very grateful if you were to consider hitting the subscribe button, because it does make a really big difference to me. We recently hit the quarter million subscriber mark, and somehow are already at 270,000 subscribers. So, to see 300,000 would be very, very nice, and it'll cost you nothing to help me on that journey. Anyway, what is it that we have today, and how does it differ from the last one that I drove, beyond the obvious? In mechanical terms, really nearly nothing. The only two significant differences are the fact this being a later car, it has the Thor engine in it, still a Rover V8 displacing 4.6 litres, but now with new Bosch engine management. It's actually slightly down on power versus the old one, by about 10 horses, this making 220. Torque, though, is up from 280 pound-foot to 300. That's 407 newton meters of torque. Not that, in all honesty, I really notice it. The gearbox is a four-speed automatic, which does the job, and it does it okay, I guess, but it's not really anything to write home about. The other real difference between this and that is that the previous one I drove had had the air suspension removed and replaced with traditional coils and springs. This one still has it intact, and I think it's a little bit better for it. It certainly feels like a more composed, sophisticated ride. Not exactly super plush, but still a little bit more resolved. I like it. It's not what you'd call a driver's car, but still, it's a commanding thing to be in, does have a nice sense of weight and heft about it, and I'm really becoming quite attached to these old ranges. I think it's fair to say that the P38 was a car that really did struggle to find love from both consumers and even its own maker. At the time, you see, Land Rover was a business in a state of flux, essentially a very big and expensive corporate-sized game of pass the parcel. This car began life essentially as a Rover product, then became BMW, then come the end of its term, it was essentially a Ford. Not that they really had all that much direct input. In fact, neither did BMW, and that's one of the reasons the car was replaced quite so soon with the generally better loved L322, in which they had a far more significant hand. Though today's video is chiefly about the Holland & Holland, it would also be remiss of me not to mention the company's first attempt at making a sexier, more upmarket P38. That came the year before, in 1999, in the form of the Lindley. Named for Lord Lindley, this was a car designed to be about as upmarket as the firm thought it could go, and produced in extremely limited numbers, originally 20, then 10, and eventually only selling actually 6. At a quick glance, you'd 
struggle really to think that there was anything special about it at all. And I think the choice of black over black over black was a pretty poor one. The fact was that this was a car that was genuinely special. That black paintwork bespoke to the Lindley, all 12 coats of it. Watchmaker's polish was used on the glass to make it as crystal clear as possible, and throughout only the highest quality materials were used. Land Rover's special vehicle division applied some 200 hours on the car to make it as good as it could possibly be. Unfortunately, it also came with a price tag that for the day was eye-watering, £100,000. By the standards of 2023, that sounds like a laughably small amount of money for a limited edition Range Rover. Today, a hundred grand would not even get you a very highly specced one. However, you must remember that back in the day, the 4.6 litre Vogue, which gave its mechanicals to the Lindley, was £55,000. So you're talking about a car that was essentially nearly double. And let's be honest here, I don't care how many coats of paint you've thrown at the thing, once you've got a little bit of dust or dirt on it, it's going to look like just about every other black Range Rover out there. And so I think that's one reason the Lindley just wasn't a success. The next year they came up with this, the Holland and Holland, and it fared a lot better. In case you're not aware, Holland and Holland are a very high-end bespoke manufacturer of firearms based in London. They've been in the game since 1835 and are proud to tell you that their weapons are of such a high calibre, pun intended, that you could use an original 1835 item and it would still work. They are the kind of company that don't put prices on their website because that would simply be gaudy and also pointless. A Holland and Holland is made bespoke for its owner and they're not cheap. How not cheap are they? Well, allegedly, it's very easy to spend as much on one of those as you would have done on one of these. Yeah, they're pricey guns. The reason for those prices? Simple. The cost of labour. To create a Holland & Holland firearm to Sir or Madam specification can take in excess of 600 or even 1,000 hours of skilled labour. That's impressive. And though I'm not much of a weapons fetishist, I have to say there is something really to be admired about the art that goes into making these things. They are genuinely beautiful and even if you don't agree with that statement, they are certainly the product of some serious care, attention and high level craftsmanship. And for that reason, I think the Holland & Holland is a brilliant car. This may not be the most impressive special edition ever made. Mechanically, it's exactly the same as a 4.6 litre Vogue. However, I think this really works because it takes everything about the Range Rover that was good and then turns it up to 11. You see, I think just about any other manufacturer hopping into bed with a gun maker would just seem a little bit weird unless maybe it was the Dodge Ram Smith & Wesson edition. That probably would sell, and um, I expect maybe they've made that already. Does anybody know of any other collaborations between car makers and gun makers? I don't. If you do, please hop into the comment section now and tell me. I would be fascinated to know, perhaps the uh, topic of a future video. So then, what actually makes a Range Rover Holland & Holland? As mentioned, mechanically, this car is a 2000 4.6 litre Range Rover Vogue, making it already a very late example of the P38, which was discontinued in 2001. To this, you add a Tinton green paint, which I have to say is a touch disappointing. It's a bespoke paint job exclusively for the Holland & Holland, but even in the flesh, on a sunny day, it's not quite as green as I'd hoped. Certainly nowhere near as much as the previous P38 I drove, which is Epsom green. The wheels are 18-inch Hurricane items, the same as you'd see on many other Range Rover, but they've been given a little flash of green to make them stand out just a touch. And actually, it looks much better than you might imagine. It's the inside though where this car is the most different and I think absolutely wondrous. You see, I like to believe that every car making nation on earth has its own speciality. The Americans are brilliant at making barrel chested drag strip monsters with nice big throaty V8s. The Italians do the glorious, wonderful, highly strung supercar bit like nobody else. The Japanese, meanwhile, are excellent not just at your humdrum everyday shopping car, but also the technological tour de force that was a four-wheel drive turbocharged monster of the 1990s and early 2000s. 
the French then are wonderful at quirky, weird, oddball little cars that have a wonderful ride quality, and the Germans, well, they do German stuff incredibly well. Big, powerful saloon cars that are naturally at home on the Autobahn. But what about the British then? Well, I think our trump card is the quality of a high-end interior. Because though a German, Japanese, or even on occasion American vehicle can have a very nice interior with plenty of luxury stuff, none of them really have quite that sense of occasion and opulence that you get from something British. Without feeling stuffy, without feeling overbearing, these are glorious cars. And of course, not just the Rolls Royces and Bentleys of the world, but also the likes of Jaguar, and most importantly for today, Land Rover. And I suppose specifically, Range Rover. To that end, inside the Holland & Holland, you will find that the already rather nice, warm and luxurious interior of the P38 has been lifted to a whole different level, through the addition of a number of features that all add up to make something rather special. So, in no particular order, throughout the cabin you have this glorious walnut wooden trim, exactly as you would find on a Holland & Holland gunstock. You have here these beautiful little inlays, each handmade. Below this you have door handles which, though difficult to appreciate on camera, have a very slight blue tint to them, designed to echo the look of a firearms barrel after a number of shots have gone through it and heated the metal. The leather then, also bespoke to the Holland & Holland, is a brown bridle leather, echoing that as you'd get on a horse's saddle. And look closer, you'll notice on the head and armrests the side have been embossed with a beautiful pattern designed to echo that of the grain from a nice fine piece of wood. Further down the door card you've got more of said leather. The speaker grills for the Harman & Kardon system also have a surround in the same Oh, further down the door card you have even more brown leather, and even the surround for the standard fit Harman Kardon stereo also has the same blue tint to it as you find on the door handles. In the boot, behind that classic split tailgate you get of a Range Rover, there's even a fold-out picnic table, which does take a little bit of assembly, but also bespoke to the Holland & Holland. There weren't all that many options you could choose from with this car, but one you could have, and I'm delighted to say this car does in entirely standard guise, is an entertainment system, which features a pair of Sony TVs in the back of the headrests, and I think just about my favourite thing in any car ever, a VHS player. Yep, down here in the centre console you've got a portable VHS. Absolutely fantastic. Down here you have the controls for what I presume are the headphones you could have to listen in the back. You've got a power switch and a headphone button, so what that does I don't know, presumably routes the system either through the speakers or not. And completing the interior, the obligatory picnic tables. To create a Holland & Holland, Range Rover's Special Vehicle Operations Department lavished an extra 30 hours on each vehicle manually, making sure that every single one of them was made to the highest of standards. They sold in total 400 of them, and unlike the previous Lindley, they did actually shift them. Perhaps unsurprisingly for a car that has an association with a gun maker, three quarters of them were destined for the United States, with one quarter, a hundred in other words, being kept back for the UK. The rumour is that about seven of those were then sold to the Netherlands in left-hand drive guise, but today it isn't exactly sure how many of these remain on the road. Though they are, indeed, a very special thing to the vast majority of people, they are just a slightly more expensive Range Rover, though when new, much more sensibly priced than the Linley. If you recall, that was £100,000 versus the sort of 54 to 55 of a regular Vogue. This was 63 or 70 if you had the TVs in the back. Today, though, what are you going to pay to get into one of these? Well, given the rarity, that is hard to say. I would think, at a guess, anywhere between 10 to £20,000, depending on the state of the car. Unfortunately, one of the biggest problems with special editions like this is that many of the pieces are very difficult to replace, and because they were very nice and quite desirable, they did like to go walkabout on occasion. 
today. This means if you're looking at buying one of these, it is worth making sure the car has all the pieces that you require. Even the Holland & Holland badge on the back, I am told, is essentially unobtainium. And that means if you're looking to buy one, it can be a little trickier than it might otherwise. If you're simply looking for a nice, decent P38, you're probably best looking elsewhere. But if, like this car's owner, Yuri, you're after something that's just a little bit special, that has an air of different about it, this is a very, very fine car. And one reason I wanted to draw a highlight to this is because I think nowhere near enough attention is given in the motoring press as a whole to the quality of an interior. We're all so keen to talk about 0 to 60 times, top speeds, brake horsepower, the size of your discs, but very, very few people talk about the quality of leather, how much space you've got for your legs in the back, what the headliner feels like. This one, incidentally, is sagging a little bit. And this, I think, is a shame, and I hope something that's going to be of much more interest to people in the coming years. As cars threaten to become ever more homogenous, I think we're going to be looking for ways to differentiate them. And for me, the interior quality of a vehicle has surely got to be one of those. When you're in something that's electric, you're not going to have the different sounds of a V6, V8, V10 and V12 to tell a car apart. Instead, it'll be essentially meaningless if you've got four, five, six, seven, eight thousand horsepower. Nobody's really, really going to care, I think. But interior quality, that's something you can appreciate every moment of every day that you're in your car. And okay, this car's not perfect. It still has plenty of iffy looking switch gear, which even in 2000 wasn't exactly fantastic, but it has character by the bucket load. It's a wonderful, glorious thing. I really do quite adore it. And uh, I love cars that stand out. I love cars that have just a little bit of personality. And this, this really does. So that's a little bit of a different look at a car from me. I hope you have enjoyed today's video. And if you have, please hop into the comment section down below and tell me what's your favorite special edition or car interior? What really floats your boat? Or do you simply not care? Is it black leather, fabric or Alcantara for sir or madam every time? Please let me know. Anyway, a huge thanks to all of you for watching and of course to Yuri for bringing his car out. Don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.